Hi, my name is Paul Drabeck and I have a secret to confess. It's something that's kind of, you know, hard to come out with in public. So, well, you see, I am completely addicted to roller coasters and amusement parks. I spent my lifetime when not being a father, husband, and working in logistics, trying to ride as many roller coasters as humanly possible. My current coaster count on my spreadsheet is 544 different roller coasters. The reason I am up here in front of you today is that roller coasters and amusement parks are not just fleeting moments of fun that aren't important or meaningful. They've influenced history, they've helped change society, they've introduced the world to new technologies, they've brought people together, they've influenced our culture, and most importantly, they've made the world a better place by introducing a little bit more fun into all of our lives. Now they say that to each of us, history begins the day we were born. I was born on a cold and snowy day back in January of 1972, but we're not going to go quite that far back to dig into the when and why roller coasters and amusement parks in their various forms are so meaningful. Well, not just yet. What we're going to do is we're going to start back in the spring of 1975. I was three years old and growing up in the Chicago suburbs, and the closest I came to a roller coaster or an amusement park were the tales of the long gone Riverview Amusement Park and the legendary Bob's Roller Coaster, heard around the dinner table like myths out of the past. My father had taken me to a local airport this one day. There was a fly in the town over at the Clow Airport in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and he went on to show me planes. Now, most of us, when we look at our early childhood, the memories are kind of fuzzy, like looking through frosted glass. This memory is the first one in my life that is crystal clear to me. On that field parked between a small two-seater Cessna and a crop duster sat the most striking thing I'd seen in my three years of existence. Sitting on a few blocks of wood, just like the cars in these photos, was the lead car to the Chicago Loop that was under construction nearby, along with the old Chicago Shopping Center and Amusement Park. The car was bright yellow, and it just glowed in the sunlight, and I quickly forgot about the planes. Climbing up into it, I sat in the seat and pulled the restraints down, and my mind went crazy with everything that this coaster could be. For the rest of the day, I was either sitting in the car pretending to ride, underneath it spinning the wheels, fiddling with the chain dog, and looking at every single part of it that I possibly could. I don't remember much after that day until June of that year when Old Chicago finally opened to the public. Now, most of you have never heard of Old Chicago, and that's because it was, well, as I call it, a successful colossal failure. It was a giant indoor shopping center with the first indoor amusement park in the middle of it. It was successful because for those few who visited during the park's short history, extremely vivid memories were made. It was a colossal failure because it only lasted five years. With cost overruns during construction, a resulting bankruptcy, the complex changing hands, the mall floundering with no anchor department stores, a huge theme park opening up on the north side of Chicago for competition, and being a loud amusement park in a giant concrete box that didn't make for a pleasant guest experience, Old Chicago was doomed. The only thing that is left of Old Chicago is a street name and a lot of memories. To me, a visit to Old Chicago was a magical experience. To get to the park, you had to walk through the mall's grand entrance, through the mall's streets that were made to look like those of the 1800s, before you came to an opening with an enormous, into an enormous room with a domed roof that was full of lights, rides, and so much fun. It had spinning rides, a log flume, games, a haunted house, a dark ride, a multi-story kids' play area, and it had three roller coasters, including the second modern looping roller coaster, the old Chicago Loop, all under one roof. Now, it wasn't just the rides that made old Chicago and later amusement parks magical places for me. During old Chicago's brief existence, my parents' marriage sped towards a divorce. My father moved out, and soon afterwards, the man who became my stepfather moved in. To label those years as stressful would be an understatement. My family was shattering, but the only place we ever went together, whether it was with my parents, with each parent alone, or with my mother and my stepfather, a trip to old Chicago was the only time when all of the stress was left behind, we had fun, and those were the few times where we actually felt like a family during that time. Now, while I was fascinated with roller coasters, including drawing them, building models of them with cardboard, watching the news whenever they teased a story on new rides, collecting any newspaper articles on them I could find, I was completely terrified of them. Standing on the midway, I'd look up at the old Chicago Loop as it corkscrewed overhead, and I was struck with fear. 
My parents dragged me on the coasters there and elsewhere, but I was just certain that that thin steel structure holding up the track really wasn't strong enough in the time I rode it, it was all gonna come tumbling down. That was till I turned 16 in 1988. A trip to Six Flags Great America or Six Flags Asteroid as my dad had moved to Houston at the time was always the highlight of the summer despite my fears. There were always a few rides I had enough courage to ride like the Wizard at Great America, but that was pretty much it. Then something special got me on the tallest, fastest looping coaster in the world that summer and removed my fears forever. A special thing was a pretty girl. The daughter of my brother's music teacher, who was a year older, was going to Six Flags Great America with two older girls, and she asked if I wanted to come along. Now, being honest, at that time, if a pretty girl had wanted to drive me to the dentist for a root canal, I'd say yes. But this was to an amusement park, so there's no way I'd say no. Now, going back in the 1980s, it was all about the loop, with parks vying to the tallest, fastest coaster with the most loops. Every summer, there was a park that went a little bit taller and a little bit faster and turned you upside down more than anyone else. In 1988, Shockwave was the ride. At 170 feet tall, which is some 97 feet taller than the old Chicago Loop that terrified me, Shockwave towered over all the coasters at Six Flags Great America. Through the gates, we headed straight for it and my heart was racing and I was in a full-on anxiety attack. Pretty girl or panic attack? What was gonna win out? Well, you obviously know the answer to that question, as if the panic attack went out and I didn't ride, there's no way I'd be standing here before you today. Seated in the front row and heading up the lift hill with the click, click, click of the anti-rollback safety device, my heart was racing, my hands were sweating, and I absolutely knew that I was going to die. The car slowly crept over the top of the lift and you could see people that looked like ants way below, and then I looked over at the girl. She smiled at me. And at that moment, all of the fear, terror, dread, and anxiety just went away. Then we spiraled from those dizzying heights down, down to the ground at 65 miles an hour through three loops, a double looping boomerang, and a corkscrew to finish it all off. Then we did it again and again. Then we rode the rest of the coasters at the park, and somewhere after an hour or so, the other two girls went off, and the pretty girl and I rode Shockwave over and over. We lost count sometimes after 30 laps on Shockwave that day. The girl was the one who got me over my fears and let me be the coaster enthusiast that I was trying to get out for all those years. That day with her was one of those important points that put me on the narrow path that has taken me here today. My only regret about the whole thing is I wish I remembered her name. From that point on, there was no coaster big or small that I would not ride. During the couple of the years I lived in Houston, if I couldn't get a ride from family or if my friends weren't going, I'd ride my bike 15 miles to go to Six Flags Astroworld. During college, I ended up dating a ride operator at Six Flags Great America, which allowed Agni access to the park's employee ride nights where I was able to ride the revolutionary Batman the Ride, which had six to eight hour waits during normal park operations. Now, during these employee ride nights, I was able to ride them over and over again after the park closed with her. In 1994, I graduated college with a degree in communications, and a year later, I was married, and as always, my Six Flags season pass was used and abused. That is when I could afford a trip because, you know, adulthood and bills set in. Now, another thing about me is that I grew up with computers as my stepfather's a programmer. I played with my first computer in 1977, and it was a mainframe computer about the size of a basketball court. We had a computer at home in the early 1980s, and I had access to networks well before the word internet was in use. Moving out on my own, a PC was my first big purchase, and with my wife in college, we were able to dial up into what was known as the World Wide Web through her university. In the mid-1990s, there was no Facebook, there was no Wikipedia, and there definitely was no YouTube. With a good connection at 56 kilobytes, if there was a 300 pixel wide photo on a web page, it took minutes to load up. Now, only a few people were online back then, and if you wanted to be able to post something that someone else could read and comment on, you went to Usenet. Usenet was social media decades before that phrase was ever invented. It was a primitive system that had news groups devoted to different topics. Now, back then, as the internet was being invented, most of them were groups dedicated to technical conversations. Then there was the REC subgroup, and nested in there was a group called REC.Roller-Coaster. 
RFC, as, we, as it was called by those who frequent it, is where I learned that I was not alone. There were people in there from all around the world in there, and despite coming from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different countries, and being as different as people can be on this planet, they all love coasters and amusement parks just like I did. I'd found my tribe and where I had scant information on where there were rides, who made them in their history, with all of us getting together online, there was this great tribal text memory to draw from. I mean, have you ever wanted to know the startup procedures that go into turning a coaster on at the beginning of the day? Do you want to have a, a detailed history of the pioneering steel coaster designer Anton Schwarzkopf? Is it worth it to visit this then little park in Indiana called Holiday World with their one wooden roller coaster called the Raven? What class of coasters were still in operation? All of these questions and more were there on my computer at the other end of my modem and was there for me 24-7, 365. Now, this is where I was able to get into the history of amusement parks and roller coasters, and that's where we're going to go now. To get there, we really need to go way back in time. Going back to the earliest, mankind has always needed to celebrate. It might be for a good harvest, the changing of the seasons, or just the fact that we survived another day. You can look back through all the archaeological record of human civilization. No matter where you look, there are ceremonial plazas, records of feasts, massive sporting grounds, or other places and reasons where people would come together to celebrate. There's just an almost biological need to get together and have fun wired into our species. You know, an amusement park like a Six Flags, a World of Fun, a Cedar Point, a Disneyland, those are just a long string of places that human beings have built to satisfy our need to get out together and have fun. Moving a little bit closer into our time in the 17th century, across the European continent, there are pleasure gardens like London's Vauxhall Gardens started to open up. These are places where city dwellers of all classes could take a break from work. They could leave the grimy, dirty city behind, bring a blanket and a picnic basket full of some food and a nice pint, lay that down underneath the tree, and they could have a day of fun. Now, places devoted to recreation like Vauxhall Gardens were the precursors to amusement parks and really kind of where the first proto roller coasters first came into existence. The French took to the traditional Russian ice slide, which is a man-made structure coated in ice during the harsh Russian winters that people slide down, and the French converted it into warm weather fun by building the slide with rollers so people could enjoy the speed and fun of going down the mountains in the summertime. Russian mountains, as they were known as, became a staple of summer fun in France and beyond. Now, over here, from the beginning of our 13 colonies through statehood and beyond, for recreation, people gathered at picnic groves on the edge of towns like Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, or at seaside towns like Gravesend on the edge of Brooklyn that is now known as Coney Island. Where our roller coaster journey begins, though, that leads the world to literally being turned upside down is in a coal mining town in eastern Pennsylvania. The town of Mount Chuck, which was at the center of the Industrial Revolution, with coal needed to feed the furnaces that turned this country from an agricultural one into the world's industrial superpower. Mining is part of the process, but the other part is transporting the coal to where it was actually needed. In 1828, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company built and opened the Mount Chunk Switchback Railway with the purpose of moving coal from the mines to the river where it could be transported to foundries elsewhere. Instead of having engines leading each train like the railroads we're used to today, they used the mountainous terrain of the area with two giant lifts, one some 664 feet tall that to pull the coal cars to the top of the Mount Pigsaw and Mount Washington before letting them coast downhill to their destination. The entire loop was 18 miles long and took the cars 80 minutes to make the loop under gravity. Now, if you look through history, especially paying attention to technology, eventually something less expensive and more reliable comes along to do the job, and suddenly what was once used is now worthless. You know, thinking back to television, you used to have bulky cathode ray tubes for televisions, but now we've got little bitty thin plasma screen TVs. You know, plasma became cheaper and more reliable and nicer and more convenient, and the cathode ray tubes are kind of worthless. Same kind of happened for the Mount Chunk Switchback Railroad as it eventually found itself worthless for hauling coal. But it could haul something else, people. The Mount Chunk Switchback Railway was a tourist railway from 1872 until 1932 when the Great Depression forced its closure. 
Now you can still enjoy some of the Mount Chunk Switchback Railway, but you cannot find Mount Chunk on a map anymore. The town is still there, but it's now known as Jim Thorpe after the famous Olympian. When Jim, who was an international superstar at the time, passed away in 1953, the town of Mount Chunk, which had fallen in hard times, agreed to, agreed to name the town after the Olympian and pay his window for it as long as he was buried there in the hopes of becoming a tourist attraction. It really didn't work, but what remains of the Switchback Railway can be enjoyed on two wheels today instead of four. It is now a mountain bike trail. Now, there's a small plot of land on the corner of Surf Avenue and 10th Street, Coney Island, Brooklyn, that is sacred in the roller coaster world. The legendary Coney Island Cyclone has thrilled tens of millions on the site since 1927. What came before the cyclone started a long chain of events that leads all of us here today. On that site in 1884, LaMarcus Adna Thompson opened the Switchback Railway. For a mighty sum of five cents, riders climbed to the top of a 50-foot tall tower where they boarded a train and were pushed out in the track by attendants. The switchback would then be under its, the power of gravity as it went on a hill-filled run down 600 feet of track until it slowed at another tower. At that point, riders would climb out and the ride attendants would push the train up the hill and switch it onto a second parallel track, where guests would reboard the train for a run back into the station. Thompson's switchback was so popular that out of those five cent tickets, he would profit over $600 a day, which works out to around $18,000 a day today. Now, with profits like that, scenic railway started popping up at seaside resorts and picnic groves and pleasure gardens all around the world. Profits also drove innovation as the more people you can get on a ride in the day, the more money you can make. In 1885, Philip Hinkle took Thompson's idea, removed the manual labor, added a motor and a chain lift to pull the train up the hill, and made the track circular to a big complete circuit coaster. Not to be outdone, Thompson fought back by building more scenic railways with tunnels, elaborately themed scenes, and longer rides. You could say that the coaster wars of which park had the biggest and fastest ride began shortly after coasters were born. Now, people loved the thrill and the faster the better. The problem was this is the era of trial and error, and sometimes the errors meant that riders were killed. There were no safety standards, no lap bars, no state inspections like we have now. If someone stood up on a ride and plummeted to their deaths, like happened on the opening day of the Crystal Beach Cyclone, the ride shut down long enough for the body to be removed before reopening for riders. In 1891, a 19-year-old John Miller from Homewood, Illinois, walked into the offices of Marcus Thompson and the coaster world has not been the same since. Within a few years, he became Thompson's chief engineer, building coasters all around the world. In 1910, he filed a patent for the safety chain dog, which it makes the click clicky clack sound that you hear when a coaster goes up a lift hill. That device keeps a coaster from rolling backwards down the lift hill in case of a chain break. From 1910 to 1931, John filed over 30 patents from safety devices for coasters, track design, spinning coaster cars, and in 1919, he filed patent number 1,319,888. The under friction wheel was filed. Now this is the patent that over time literally turned the world upside down as it locks the train to the track with three sets of wheels. One on the top of the track is called the road wheel. The guide wheel is either on the inside or outside of the track to control lateral motion. And John Miller's under friction or upstop wheel, as it is called today, is underneath the rail and it locks the coaster train to the track. This three wheeled configuration made it so roller coasters can safely go over hills at high speed, drop straight down, loop upside down, and turn you every way a coaster designer wants to send you while safely keeping the train secured to the track. John Miller was kind of the Thomas Edison of the roller coaster world. John Miller worked on coasters and different designs until his death of a heart attack while building a coaster in Houston in 1941. He took the primitive coasters of the late 1800s that had gentle dips and speeds of 10 miles an hour and turned them into the thrill machines going 50 or more miles an hour with steep drops, helixes, and my favorite, hills filled with airtime. He made rides safer and he built over 150 different roller coasters of which sadly only eight of them have been preserved and are still running today. 
Now you can find coasters all over the world from small towns to major cities, but once John Miller locked the train to the track, it all changed and fellow designers were off to the races designing rides that pushed the bounds and sometimes went well past them. Pryor and Church designed twisty coasters like the Giant Dipper that is still the king of the boardwalk in Santa Cruz some 98 years later. Going beyond the boundaries, Harry Traver's legendary triplets at Crystal Beach, Palisades Park, and Revere Beach were so intense with spiraling drops, banking on turns to almost 90 degrees, and forces that literally shook the steel structure apart. The triplets were so intense, they had a nurse with smelling salts on duty when they ran the coaster to help wake up riders who had passed out due to the ride's extreme negative G, extreme G forces. Now let's go back a little while to a corner of Kansas City, Missouri for a twist in the story of roller coasters and amusement parks. In 1910, a family moved into 3028 Belfine Tiny Avenue in Kansas City. That family, in that family was a nine-year-old who grew up with his father's tales of building and visiting the 1893 Chicago's World's Columbian Exhibition. Now that fair was kind of the precursor to the theme parks of today. It was all themed up and called the White City, and it was built around a lake with enormous themed pavilions where they, were, where they had different things like in industry and agriculture. And it really was a place where you saw the world changing, the debut of world changing technologies like alternating currents, the electric dishwasher, the world's first practical electrical car, and a wheel that was 264 feet tall and carried 2,160 people at once. That wheel was designed by a gentleman named George Ferris, and the wheel became so popular, people have called them Ferris wheels ever since. Now, back to the boy in Kansas City. A few blocks from his family's home was a smaller version of Chicago's white city named Electric Park. The park was a trolley park that was built at the end of the city's trolley line to encourage ridership on evenings and weekends during the summertime. Electric Park had fanciful architecture, dance halls, rides, nighttime fireworks, and a roller coaster. That boy would visit Electric Park with a share of the earnings from the family's paper routes. When he didn't have enough for admission, he would look through the fence at the park and dream about having his own amusement park. That boy pictured to the right was Walter Elias Disney. And that dream later became Disneyland. For the first 30 years of the 20th century, amusement parks large and small expanded, not just from coast to coast, but all around the world. From large cities like Chicago with its Riverview Park, that was the only place during Prohibition where the Capone Gang and the O'Bannon Gangs had a truce. Riverview was one of the largest amusement parks of its time. It had eight wooden roller coasters in 1930. It was not, it was not just the cities that had amusement parks and roller coasters, but small towns as well. In Joplin, Missouri, Electric Park had the Daisy Dozer and Lover's Tub coasters that ran until the park closed in 1940. In Lawrence, Kansas, there was Woodland Park that had the Daisy Dozer coaster that closed in the 1920s and sat overgrown and rotting until the park was finally swept away by floods in the 1950s. You know, everywhere you went from big cities with large organized amusement parks to small towns with rides tucked into the town parks, roller coasters covered the globe and there's nowhere you could go and not find a coaster to ride. The end of that started in the fall of 1929 with the great stock market crash. With many American savings gone, businesses closing, and almost one in four out of work, people were more worried about how they were going to feed their families, and very few people had extra money for an evening in an amusement park. Sadly, many of the parks fell silent over the next decade, and countless roller coasters were turned into firewood. Now, throughout the struggle of the Great Depression in Anaheim, California, Walter Knott expanded his family's popular berry stand with a restaurant that served his wife's fried chicken recipe. Mrs. Knott's chicken became so popular that people would wait three or more hours in line for a seat. Now, to entertain those in line, Walter started adding a fake volcano and buildings from the Old West were his ghost town that he populated with real cowboys and Indians to entertain, to entertain them. Walter Knott's Calico Ghost Town was the seat of the theme park that is currently known is Knott's Berry Farm. On December 7th, 1941, the United States was attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, drawing us into the Second World War. The few amusement parks that had survived the Great Depression suddenly had to deal with rationing, and fewer patrons with young Americans headed for war instead of the Midway. 
Seaside parks like Coney Island, Atlantic Beach, or Santa, the Santa Monica Pier had to go dark as soon as the sun went down due to their lights silhouetting ships, making them easier for German and Japanese submarines to target. Now, to show the effect of the Great Depression and the Second World War had on coasters and amusement parks throughout the 1920s, let's look at how many coasters were built each year. Throughout the 1920s, there was an average of 26 new coasters built per year. From 1930 to 1945, there was an average of just six new coasters per year, with 1943 and 1944 being the height of the World War II, having no new coasters. Now, 1945 saw the tide turn not just for the war, but for the coaster world in an unexpected direction. In April of that year, Adolf Hitler committed suicide, and shortly after, there was peace in Europe. In August of that year, after two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan and under unconditional surrender signed, there was, the war was brought to an end. Returning from the horrors of war, though, millions of soldiers were looking for a bit of fun, and as a result, amusement parks were booming. Well, two things were really booming at that time amusement parks, and babies. With the baby boom in full swing as the 1940s turned into the 1950s, if you take a look at the coasters being built, they went from being taller, faster, and wilder, like the rides in the 1920s and 30s, to being not so tall, not so fast, not that thrilling. You might, I mean, you might ask why there stopped being a demand for bigger and faster thrills, and that has to do with the post-war baby boom. With a nation of toddlers, amusement parks needed something for an overabundance of young families. As a result, existing parks started adding sections for, full of kids' rides. Looking at the coasters that were being built, you see a lot of rides named the Comet Junior or the Little Dipper. Entire parts, parks sprouted up geared towards children like Kittyland in the Chicago suburbs. Now, going back a little bit to a small town in Indiana, named Santa Claus, there was an industrialist looking for a retirement project. And he saw the rise of families who flocked to the little town looking for something to do. Now, Walter Nahn had added theming around his berry stand and his wife's chicken restaurants well before this time, but there were no rides there yet. In 1946, Lewis Cook built a park with a restaurant, a toy store, a petting zoo, and rides that were all themed around Santa Claus, the town it was located in. The world's first theme park was in Santa Claus and was Santa Claus Land, and with with which there is a fourth generation currently leading the park today, that is now known as Holiday World. Now, having a theme was really something different, but what really changed the world and led to what we have today was the combination of a small engineering shop in Mountain View, California, and the world's best storyteller. The storyteller was Walt Disney. At the end of the 1940s, he started taking his daughters to amusement parks in the Los Angeles area. Now, what Walton noticed while the, his daughters were riding was that, for the most, parks were dirty, unorganized, and very little went into planning them. But he did see that parks and rides delivered experiences. And that's when the light went off in Walt's head. Why not use the amusement park, like a movie theater, to tell a story? The idea electrified Walt, who started pulling some of his best and brightest from Walt Disney Studios to work on his park. At the same time, Ed Morgan and Carl Bacon had started Aero Development. At first, first, nothing more than a machine shop, they eventually worked into building car rides and carousels for small parks around the country. Now, while investigating the amusement park industry, eventually Ed, Carl, and Walt's path, paths crossed. Disneyland opened on July 17, 1955 with Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, the Dumbo Flying Elephant, Casey Jr. Circus Train, and the Mad Tea Party, Snow White Scary Adventures. They were all built by Arrow Development. Eventually, Arrow would go on to work on It's a Small World, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Flying Saucers, Adventure Through Inner Space, and The Haunted, Mount, the Haunted Mansion. Now, what Arrow built for Disneyland in 1959 revolutionized the world of roller coasters. After traveling to Europe, Walt decided to add a copy of the Matterhorn Mountain to his park. He wanted to fill it with a bobsled ride, and the task was given to Ed and Carl over at Arrow. What Walt wanted was something fast and smooth that would be able to handle Disneyland's massive crowds. Now, building the ride out of wood was out. There were metal coasters at the time, like Wild Mouse coasters, but they were built out of angle iron, which is hard to bend in the smooth track. 
Now, Ed and Carl looked around and settled on using tubular steel, which has the benefit of being able to accurately bent into any shape. The second innovation for the Matterhorn was the use of polyurethane wheels, which smoothed out the ride, reduced noise, and were low maintenance. Disneyland and the Matterhorn were massive successes, and as you know, success breeds imitation. Suddenly, every city wanted their own Disneyland. Lots of parks tried to bottle what Disney got right and didn't quite succeed. For example, Freedom Land USA was built on marshland in the Bronx and it opened in 1960. It only lasted four years before closing forever. In Texas, though, real estate developer Angus Wynn started visiting after visiting Disneyland, decided that the Lone Star State needed its own version of Disneyland. With a park theme to the six governments that ruled over the state throughout its history, Six Flags Over Texas opened on August 4th, 1961, and was the first park to offer a pay one price admission instead of where guests paid per ride. In the following year, Six Flags Over Texas opened the world's first log flume in 1963. And in 1966, they opened the Runaway Mine Train, which was Arrow's second tubular steel coaster and the world's first mine train coaster. Six Flags Over Texas was a massive success, and in 1967, they opened Six Flags Over Georgia, and in 1971, Six Flags Over Mid-America opened outside of St. Louis. Both opened with regional theming and a slew of rides, which, which included mine trains made by Aerodynamics. Now, at the beginning of the speech, I mentioned that the amusement parks have helped change history and society. A dark strain, stain on our history, unfortunately, is up through the 20th century, many amusement parks, like large portions of the country, were segregated with maybe a day or two a year where Americans of African, dis African descent could visit. During the civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., restaurants, stores, and amusement parks that had segregationist policies were targeted. For example, Fairland Park in Kansas City only allowed Black Americans to visit on the last operating day of the season. As Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in 1963, you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she's told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky. After three years of civil rights activists getting arrested for the shocking act of attempting to visit Fairland and other amusement parks around the country, in 1963, Kansas City broadened the city's city public accommodations law to ban Fairland's policy of segregation. And on July 2nd, 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed, opening amusement parks across the country for all Americans. Now the 1960s, 70s and 70s saw a slew of theme parks open across the land. Astroworld in Houston opened in 1968, while Disney World in Florida and Magic Mountain outside of Los Angeles opened in 1971. Kings Island opened outside of Cincinnati in 1972. Bush Gardens Williamsburg opened in 1975. Marriott opened two Great America Parks in Santa Clara, California and Gurney, Illinois in 1976. In addition to new parks, themed attractions like Knott's Berry Farm and Silver Dollar City started adding, adding rides and switching to a pay one price admission plan. Also existing parks like Cedar Point in Ohio and Lagoon in Utah started adding new rides to compete with the new parks on the block. And of course, the best way to compete is to build a roller coaster taller, faster, and more intense than ever before. Mine trains were just the start for parks, and soon Arrow was not alone in the steel coaster business. Over in Germany, Anton Schwarzkopf, who got into the amusement industry through his father's carriage company that built specialized carriages for carnivals, started building roller steel roller coasters. In 1964, with designer Werner Stingle, he created, he created the Wildcat portable coaster of which numerous copies were made. He concentrated on producing production line portable steel coasters for fairs until 1971 when he built the Big Ben coaster for Six Flags Over Texas. The Big Ben mixed tubular steel track with German engineering and Park started to take notice of this competitor of Arrows. With not only Parks in competition have the biggest and best coaster, and Arrow and Schwarzkopf in competition to deliver them, the Coaster Wars was officially declared. 
1972, Arrow took their mine train and went big with the Dexter Freebish electric roller ride that was 88 feet tall at Houston's Astroworld. Now, while that doesn't seem like that much of a step today, it was an evolutionary step that started us on the path to multi-looping coasters and the hyper giga and strata coasters of today. Now, 1972 is really a banner year for coasters, as on the outskirts of Cincinnati after decades of annual flooding by the Ohio River, the owner of that city's Coney Island Amusement Park decided to move and build a modern theme park. Located in Kings Mills, Ohio, which is quite away from the Ohio floodplain, Kings Island needed a star attraction to open with. They reached out to the Philadelphia Toboggan Company with its chief designer, John Allen, and the twin-tracked racing coaster named aptly The Racer, set the theme park industry alight and reminded the world that the wooden coaster could be the big ride at a park. Soon parks were looking to add wooden coasters as well as steel coasters to their parks. Allen was kept busy as throughout the 1970s building rides for building marquee rides for many parks. In 1973, he built the Great American Screen Machine at Six Flags Over Georgia. In 1975, he built Rebel Yell, now known as a Racer 75 at King's Dominion. And then in 1976, he built the then longest, tallest, and fastest wooden coaster in the world at Six Flags Over Mid-America, the Screaming Eagle, before retiring after designing some 26 coasters. On the steel coaster front, both Aerodynamics and Schwarzkopf were learning what tube their steel track was capable of. And in 1975, Aero turned the world upside down with the opening of the corkscrew at Knott's Berry Farm. Now, the first looping coaster opened in 1895 at Sea Lion Park in Coney Island, but those early looping coasters weren't safe and more guests wanted to watch them instead of riding them. As a result, none of those lasted for more than a few years. Arrow came up with the idea of using centrifugal force to keep the guests safely pushed into their seats as the ride rolled over through inversions. They built a full-scale replica to test the concept, and Walter Knott purchased it on-site for Knott's Berry Farm, where it opened as the corkscrew in 1975. Not to be outdone, Schwarzkopf, along with designer Werner Stingle, raised the bar with the revolution at Magic Mountain with its vertical loop in 1976. In 1977, Arrow added vertical loops to their repertoire with the opening of the double loop at Geauga Lake. In 1980, Arrow built the Carolina Cyclone at Carowinds with two vertical loops and two corkscrew inversions. In 1983, Dragon Mountain opened at Canada's Marineland with a loop called the bow tie that was a combination of a vertical loop and a corkscrew. And then in 1986, Anton Schwarzkopf opened up his five looping portable Olympia looping bond for the German fair circuit. There are innovations besides looping with steel coasters. Both Arrow and Schwarzkopf produced shuttle coasters that would launch the trains out of the station through loops and up a hill before sending the train back through the loop to the station in reverse. In 1983, Arrow opened the Bat at Kings Island, which is a suspended coaster where the cars swung from the overhead track. The Bat was short-lived as the ride was played with technical difficulties, but in 1984, learning from their mistakes, Arrow opened the Big Bad Wolf suspended coaster at Busch Gardens Williamsburg as a resounding success. Now that step that Arrow took back in 1972 with the Dexter Freebrush electric roller ride by going taller led us to 1988 when they blew away the height barrier and passed a 200 foot marker with Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point. Magnum didn't need loops, instead of the ride was all about speed and airtime and was the world's first hyper coaster. A hyper coaster is a coaster over 200 feet in height with no loops. Now with wooden coasters throughout the late 1970s and throughout the 80s, they followed the trend with steel with larger and larger coasters in demand. It really started at, at Kings Island in 1979 with the Beast with 7,539 feet of track that is still the longest wooden roller coaster in the world. In 1981, Marriott's Great America opened the Great American Eagle racing coaster with 147 feet of height. There were a few mid-sized wooden coasters like Timber Wolf that was built by Charlie Din, who built the Beast for Kings Island and designed by Curtis Summers opened up. You know, the two of those designers moved on to the 1980s and to the 1990s with the mammoth Texas giant at Six Flags Over Texas and Main Street at Cedar Point. 
The fad, though, of going bigger and bigger with wooden coasters ran out of steam, though. As Parks realized with big wooden rides, you're going to have a big maintenance budget and a lot of work to keep the ride smooth. Now, as with everything, as with the, with the development of computers, as, as, as the development of computers advanced through the 1980s into the 1990s to today, when we have computers more powerful than the giant computer I played with back in 1977 that fit in the back pocket of my jeans, the advancement of processing power and the development of software and, and mixing and computer-aided manufacturing has revolutionized the world of roller coasters as much as John Miller's under friction wheel or Arrow's tubular steel track did. Designers were able to virtually simulate every force arrived to the riders, applied to the riders and to the structure. They can work out their wildest ideas, figure out how to make them safely work, and show parks the entire ride experience without pouring one footer, bolting track together, or putting train on the track. The margin of error from designing a ride, producing the parts and building it back in the 1970s, like with the Loch Ness Monster in Busch Gardens, Williamsburg, left a gap on the track of more than a foot when it was assembled. Now, if you look at Griffin, that sits a few hundred yards away and was built in 2007, the margin of error for that ride when constructed was less than the thickness of a piece of paper. Now, with the entire history of amusement parks and roller coasters, each new generation of designers built on the lessons learned by the previous generation. You had L.A. Thompson, who passed on to John Miller, who passed on to Harry Traver and others. By the 1990s came, there was a generation of designers who got their start with Arrow, Schwarzkopf, John Allen, and others who were moving on and starting their own companies to make their own mark in coaster history. Now, Anton was always the master builder, tinkering with his designs and coasters to make them smooth, safe, and last forever. His rides that are out there like Shockwave at Six Flags Over Texas rides as smooth today in 2021 as it did when it opened in 1978. Unfortunately, Anton's perfection came at a cost. And with his profit margins whittled away with each change, his company declared bankruptcy in the 1980s. Now, Aero, which went from Aero Development to Aero Dynamics to Aero Huss, and back to Aero Dynamics due to various mergers and buyouts throughout the company's history, had a new generation of designers in the 1990s like Alan Schilke. Now, Aero was always a job shop, working from order to order with not a lot of money to develop new products. They had standard sized loops, standard sized corkscrews, standard drops, standard helixes, and for the most part, they were assembled to create new rides. With custom rides and custom elements that were brought on by computers, a new generation of designers were all the rage. Arrow in its age was slow to change, all the world changed around it. Using the power of computers in the design and manufacturing process, there are companies like Gerschlauer, Giovanola, SNS, Mac, Intamin, or Bollinger and Maviard that were really starting to make, take steel coasters beyond where Errol and Schwarzkopf were able to go to. In 1992, Bollinger and Maviard, who had made a little impact with several stand up coasters, completely blew the entire world away when they opened Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America in Illinois. The ride was perfectly themed to the Dark Knight and took a looping coaster and turned it all upside down with the train locked to an overhead track that allowed riders to loop on the outside with their feet dangling below. All of a sudden, every park wanted a wooden custom, a modern custom coaster like, like, this, like an inverted coaster and with very little to offer besides the same old coasters they've been making since the 1970s. No one really wanted a new coaster from Arrow. In the 1990s on the wood coaster front, after the huge hits to park maintenance budgets from the huge wooden coasters like the Texas Giant and Mean Streak on the big chains like Cedar Fair or Six Flags, they started passing on adding wooden roller coasters to their parks. What happened was smaller parks like Adventureland in Iowa were able to handle the construction and maintenance cost of a medium sized wooden coaster under 100 feet tall. By 1993, they hired Customs Coasters International, which was founded by the daughter of Charlie Din to build the outlaw. CCI started courting small parks and they started selling coasters. In 1994, they built the Hoosier Hurricane in Indiana Beach and Zach Zoomer in Michigan's Adventure. In 1995, CCI built three coasters, including one with just an 85 foot tall lift hill and 2,800 feet of track for the park that used to be known as Santa Claus Land. Holiday World, as it was now known, 
had expanded its theming to other holidays, and the Raven, with its airtime-filled run through the woods, was the centerpiece of the Halloween section. A ride on the Raven was amazing. In fact, I consider my first ride having been a, a religious experience. It just it blew me away, and I, I had to sit down for about half an hour to process how amazing it was. You know, all of a sudden, this little family park in rural southern Indiana was receiving the attention of not just not just from hordes of local guests seeking to try a new ride, but from roller coaster enthusiasts from around the world for this amazing coaster. As the 90s went from one innovation to when went on, innovation was everywhere. Bulger and Maviari took the floor out of the looping coaster with the floorless Bizarro at Six Flags Great Adventure in 1999. In 2000, Intamin blew the 300 foot mark away with Millennium Force at Cedar Point. That same year, Vacoma took riders and put them in a flying position for stealth at California's Great America. Arrow wasn't completely out of the swing of things as the 1990s came to an end, as they started producing one of the best wild mouse coasters and custom looping and the wild mouse coasters out there and a custom looping coaster for Dollywood. While pitching Six Flags idea after idea with no success, designer Alan Schulke threw out the idea of a fourth dimension coaster where the riders and the train flip independently of the track. Now Six Flags liked the idea and demanded a massive ride out of this completely unproven idea. Short on time and as usual short on funds, Alan and the rest of the Aero staff got to work on X. As with any prototype, there are lots of bugs to work out, and there was delay after delay with X's opening being pushed back from summer of 2001 to 2002. When the ride finally opened, the experience was rough and not quite what Six Flags wanted. As Arrow wasn't able to live up to the contract for X, Six Flags sued, and as a result, Aerodynamics declared bankruptcy, only to be absorbed by newcomer SNS Power Sports. Now, SNS is one of the many companies coming into the scene. They got their start with extreme attractions like sky coasters and bungee jumps before moving on to the in, move, before moving into the coaster world with the air launch Thrust Air 2000 at King's Dominion. Beyond SNS, there were companies like Great Coaster Inter Great Coasters International, focusing on wooden coasters that was comprised of a few ex custom coasters employees. Gerslauer rides came out of Anton Schwarzkopf's bankruptcy and in the 2000s started to make waves with their mid-sized Eurofighter and spinning coasters like Pandemonium at Six Flags St. Louis. Gio Vinola got their start as a subcontractor to Intamin and went from building submarines to building hyper coasters like Titan at Six Flags over Texas. Customs coasters went under due to a divorce and the Gravity Group emerged to create the amazing voyage at the Holiday World among other coasters. Alan Schulke left Arrow and has been behind some uh, behind insane looping wooden coasters like Outlaw Run at Silver Dollar City with Rocky Mountain coasters. Throughout the 2000s to the present day, the only constant is that anything is possible. With a new generation of designers building on the likes of Thompson, Miller, Allen, Schwarzkopf, and every other designer that came before them, their rides that once seemed the most outlandish of ideas opening up year after year. You know, Magnum XL blew away the 200 foot barrier. Millennium Force su surpassed that by, by going over 300 feet tall. Going beyond 400 feet tall though, Top Thrill Dragster and King Dakar brought the idea of a coaster with speeds of over hundred miles an hour to reality. I mean, I could have never dreamt going that fast on a coaster when I was a kid. Actually, I did dream it, but I never thought it would actually happen. Now, if you want to fly on the edge of a wing with, there's, with nothing above and nothing below you, there are wing coasters like X-Flight at Six Flags Great America. For those who fear heights, there are drop coasters that sit riders on the edge of a vertical, a vertical precipice, letting you contemplate mortality before setting you plunging earthward like Yukon Strike or Canada's Wonderland. For those who like inverting, you have vertical loops, corkscrews, top hats, immelmans, bow tie loops, boomerangs, inverted stalls, and more to turn you upside down. We live in a world where there are coasters that reach into the heavens and do things that I could never imagine they would when my fascination with them began 46 years ago. There are coasters geared towards kids, families, and even a few out there geared to the extreme thrill seeker that like me are so intense, it is almost as if the ride is trying to kill you, although they really aren't trying to. 
We have coasters out there that have been thrilling riders through the good and bad times for more than a century, like Leap to Dips at Lakemont Park in Pennsylvania. And each year, even the bad ones like 2020 and 2021, we have a few new rides to look forward to like Orion at Kings Island. Now, as I said in the beginning of this presentation, roller coasters have influenced history. They've helped change society. They've introduced the world to new technologies. They've brought people together. They've influenced our culture. And more importantly, they've made the world a better place by introducing a little bit more fun into our lives. So after this, when you have time, take a visit to your local amusement park. Take some of your favorite people with you and have a day filled with thrills. And remember how important roller coasters, amusement parks, and the experiences they create for all of us really are. Now, if you've enjoyed the history of amusement parks and roller coasters as much as I've had sharing it with you and find that like myself, you really love coasters, please look into the American Coaster Enthusiast at, a at aceonline.org. ACE is the world's oldest and largest volunteer ran coaster enthusiast organization. ACE provides members with regional and national events, news and magazines, as well as opportunities to meet fellow coaster lovers. I've been a member of ACE for decades. And for the last five, year, five years, I've been ACE's regional representative in the heart of America region that encompasses Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, and most of Illinois. That means I organize events with parks where ACE members get to ride roller coasters before or after parks are open, go, behind, go on behind the scenes tours, and hang out with fellow coaster enthusiasts. We put on annual events at Six Flags St. Louis, Worlds of Fun, and Silver Dollar City. Also, if you'd like to take a look at my travels to parks and coasters wherever I can get to them, I've been writing a travel blog called Negative G for the last 20, 21 years. On the side, I chronicle my visit to parks, write about my experiences, and give tips while showing what I see through photography. Last time I checked out over 15,000 photos on the site, and over 100 different parks listed. Again, wanted to say, want to finish up here by saying, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email address is Paul Drabeck, P A U L D R A B E K, at negative hyphen g.com. Or you can reach me on my ACE email address at P Drabeck, P D R A B E K, at aceonline.org. Thank you and have a wonderful day.